friends. Like I said, I grew up with the web and I kind of, I, I felt, feel really privileged to have all this opportunity when I was growing up. And I see on some level, I see that going away. Um, and I want to, I'm thinking like, what do I want to look back on, you know, on my deathbed one day? What, when I, what do I want to be able to say? And I want to be able to say that I tried to prevent that from, from going too far down that path, you know? Hi, welcome back to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. I'm Amy James, the co-inventor of Open Index Protocol, and also welcome to my living room. We are remodeling this studio right now. The floors are being sanded. It's completely crazy. So... I'm filming from here. In this week's episode, I am interviewing Stefan Thomas. He is the inventor of the web monetization standard, which we just did a three-part mini-series about. He's also the co-inventor of the Interledger protocol. He was a Bitcoin developer a long time ago. He was the CTO of Ripple, and he's now started his own company called Coil to serve as the first web monetization service provider. He has the rare combination of deep technical knowledge and great storytelling skills. It was really fun to talk with him and to learn about how the design of the internet inspired the design of the Interledger protocol and also why he thinks that web monetization is so important, particularly for creators, which you know is my favorite thing to talk about. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to the channel and hit the like button and I'll see you next week, probably from here one more time. Stefan Thomas, welcome to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. I'm so glad that you're here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm a big fan of the series. Well, thank you. I have become a big fan of your work doing research to make videos about it. Um, of course, you are most recently well known for losing the password to your iron key, but uh, you have done so many more interesting things in that. And that story has been really well told. So I thought that we could talk about some other things today. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely on board with that. Like I'm a little bit tired of talking about that wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that it gave you some sort of superpower to be calm no matter what, because I've noticed that in the other interviews that I've watched of yours while getting ready for this, that you're just like unfazed by almost anything, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, it's actually interesting, like, um, you know, talking about that story has really kind of brought back all the memories of like, why did I get into Bitcoin originally? Why did I get into this whole industry? And and I imagine that we'll talk a lot about a lot of those ideas and, and motivations today. Yeah, I actually wanted to start there and find out a little bit more about you beyond just, you know, what what it is that we know already that you, you know, the CTO of Ripple and now you're building the web monetization standard and you're the CEO of Coil, but tell us further back than that, like why did payments get your heart in the first place? Yeah, so I very much grew up with the web and the internet. Um, I was uh, very close friends uh, with, with um, somebody I grew up with, Fabian, um, and uh, he was sort of on the design side. I was kind of more interested in like the development side, and so we constantly would like partner on various projects, and I remember um, when when he was 11, I was 10 years old, we made sort of a website for an online shop that sold Magic the Gathering uh, collectible cards. Um, and so that's that I remember thinking like, oh, my God, like we didn't get paid cash, but we got paid in cards. And I was like, we just typed something into a computer and we got paid for it. That's amazing. And so I very early on realized that the Internet had all this opportunity and there's all this like amazing stuff you could do with that technology. Um, and so, you know, that really shaped kind of my career and it shaped my thinking and so i'm very much used to thinking as an open source developer or as a web developer um, and thinking about protocols and that sort of stuff and so um that's kind of my background and then more specifically how i got into like bitcoin and, and thinking about finance and payments um was very much around like any freelancer will tell you like it's a pain right now like there's so much so many problems with payments um, in my case, like I lost my bank account in the UK um, because I overdrew the account three times. And um, that was just because we had clients that didn't pay on time and stuff like that. So it's like just like the normal average nonsense. And um, I remember thinking, like, why is it like this? Like I can send uh, data more and more efficiently every year, but the payment industry just doesn't seem to improve. If anything, it might even be getting worse. And so I thought that was a really fascinating um, dichotomy. And, and um, I got into Bitcoin because I was like, hey, maybe this is the first time that open source software can make a difference. 
Okay. That makes sense. And I just, I, I guess I wondered if you had a background as a creator or something because you're starting coil for creators really, but it, it sounds like you don't. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, as a freelance web developer, I had to do often like the designs for the websites and stuff like that. And so um, I do a lot of sort of creative stuff in my own personal life. Like I design some of my own furniture and things like that, just like little things like that. Um, oh, cool. So I, I wouldn't say like I'm a creator per se, um, but I do think that everybody is a creator, you know, like everybody is yeah. at some level. Um, and then also I would say that for me, like the way that my creativity sort of expressed itself like professionally is through coding, like programming, which I also consider a form of creation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that perspective. That's, that's really cool. So then why, why did you decide to start with creators for, for coil with coil rather than starting with something because your background is so technical, it seems like you would understand that community more. Yeah. Great question. So I think that for us, it was like, um, we, we kind of approached it very systematically, like what use case, um, should we, should we try to tackle, um, you know, a little bit of background maybe. Um, so I was working for a long time kind of in the blockchain industry. Um, and I was always trying to figure out like, how is this technology going to go mainstream? Right. Yes, um, absolutely. And I realized that, you know, one of the things that was sort of holding it back was, um, you had all these different use cases, different people wanting to do different things. And if you wanted to have a, a, a coin or a protocol that worked differently, well, you had to start your whole separate network. And then it was not interoperable with Bitcoin or any of the other things out there. And so I started to compare that to how the internet worked where, you know, I can write my own web server, but you can still access it with your browser. And like, you know, we all sort of connected together and I got really fascinated by that difference. And so I started working on this protocol, which uh, we call Interledger protocol. Um, which very much emulates kind of the internet in the sense that, you know, you can have your own network. It doesn't even matter if it's a blockchain or something else, it, it, you know, any kind of payment network. And then you can have that be um, powering Interledger transaction, and then you can build applications on top and they don't have to care what is the technology that's used underneath. Um, and that just gives you so much more flexibility because, you know, you can build a network as a community all together rather than building all these different silos, one for every single token out there, right? Um, and so uh, for that technology, we thought that that was really cool technology that we wanted to bring to the world. But, you know, how do you get something from a theory in the lab into like a real network that people are actually using? And so we needed a use case. And we started to think about like, well, what is this technology really good at? And, you know, it's, it's kind of open. So some use cases probably need the openness more than others. Um, it's very global. Um, it can handle very small transactions, but it's very scalable, so it can handle a lot of them very easily. Um, and um, it's very good at very small payments. Um, and so when you look at all those different criteria, there were sort of two use cases that really stood out to us. One was, um, how do you pay for APIs? So for example, if you use like Twilio's APIs for sending text messages, like how do you pay for that? And like the way it works right now is you get sort of a bill at the end of the month, um, and I remember talking to the head of payments at uh, a large tech company um, and they were sort of telling me like we have literally a team that gets the bill from Twilio and then spends a week trying to reconcile that with our own logs and trying to figure out if we're being overcharged or not. And so, you know, paying with the API call opens up some interesting opportunities. So that was one of the use cases we looked at. And then the second use case was, well, you know, we're, we're, brow we're all browsing the web and we're going to all these different websites. And there isn't really like a native built-in business model for that. And so what we do is we have these workarounds where maybe there's some ads or maybe there's some website or platform that aggregates a lot of content together and then you get a subscription for that platform. Um, but there isn't really anything that feels natural uh, to somebody who, who's sort of web native, you know? And so we thought that you could build something like that with this intelligent technology. And that's why we started there. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I really like the web monetization standard now that I've learned so much about it. We uh, built a protocol called Open Index Protocol for putting public information in a decentralized place and um, knew that we would need to have a way for the kind of payments that the web monetization standard enables. And so it's always so cool to find different components of 
that you can then use that are open source uh, rather than having to completely reinvent the wheel on your own. It's really nice to kind of be able to stay in your own lane and focus on your core competency and then discuss and like problems, you know, when people bring up, oh, well, you're going to need this, you know, as we're working on this. And it's like, we know, but and here it is. It just showed up, you know? Uh <laughs> it's so funny you said it because like I had the exact same experience because people always tell us like, but what about discovery? Like, how do people find the content? And so when I found out about your stuff, I was like, Oh yeah, that's you don't use that, you know, and that's I think that's the great thing about open technologies and, and especially, you know, again, what I sort of didn't like about a lot of blockchain, it was very much like us versus them. A lot of the time it was like everyone's trying to promote their token and this and that. Um, but I think like with the sort of more internet and web inspired protocols and the protocols that can sort of work with a lot of different technologies, it really just helps bring people together and, and encourages collaboration. And so I really appreciate anyone who's, who's working on it. Totally. That. I feel like you're a kind of kindred spirit with us in that way, which was, I'll be honest, a shock um, because you were the CTO at Ripple. And because I kind of like got into the blockchain industry through the like, you know, uh, decentralization diehards and libertarian kind uh -huh. of folks were my friends in the beginning. And so I was just like, I kind of was like, oh, Ripple, it's not, you know, it's the, and so of course this guy is going to be thinking in kind of more closed financial terms only or more controlled systems. But then when I started hearing you speak about it and talk about your distaste for the office politics, I guess, of the blockchain community. I don't know exactly what to call it, but the just kind of competitive, like non-collaborative vibes compared to the open source community, which is obviously extremely collaborative. And that that was the side that you landed on. I was just like, oh, wow, this is, this is so much cooler than I realized. Yeah, it's actually really interesting. I think like I probably feel that way a lot because of my experience of like what it was like to, you know, I was a Bitcoiner first and, you know, yeah. I was actually a fairly well-known community. And then I sort of, you know, I needed a job, frankly, you know, I was running out of money. And so um, I decided to join Ripple. I loved the team. They were all really, really smart people. Um, Chris Larson having taken two companies public, I felt like I could learn a lot from them. Um, and actually the, what turned out to be, you know, the most valuable thing was actually access to the financial industry, because I think if you want to build a better future, it's really important to understand what's there already and why it works the way it does and why it's broken, you know, um, Absolutely. And, you know, talking, talking to people at banks, it's not, I really don't think that they're evil. I mean, there, there's a, maybe a very small subset of people that are deliberately doing bad things, uh, in their own self-interest, but. Um, the vast majority of, of people I met in the industry were trying to do better for their customers and they were trying to improve things, but there were sort of structural things that were deficient. And sometimes it was technical, uh, sometimes it was organizational. Like for example, Swift is, is the messaging system that a lot of banks use. And I think it has sort of a broken governance model. It's a society of banks and there's a bunch of banks that have veto power. And some of those banks have systems that are proprietary alternatives to SWIFT. And so they're not going to, they're going to veto any improvement to SWIFT and things like that, where it's kind of like, okay, you know, I can see why this is maybe not working super well, but, um, but it's also really important to understand like some things are like some friction is intentional. I'll give you one example. When we started uh, Ripple, we always thought that like instant transactions were like a huge upgrade versus like having to wait a few days. But when you think about it, transactions that go across currencies, um, the expensive part is actually the currency exchange because someone's taking a risk every time you do a currency exchange. And so what you find is that sometimes it can be actually really valuable to batch a bunch of transactions together. And if you want to do that, well, you have to have some kind of period over which you're batching. Um, and in many cases, that's why transactions take a day or two is because the bank wants to batch them together with other transactions to reduce some of the costs. Um, and I'm not saying that that is the right way to do it in every case, but it's interesting to know that there are some reasons for why things work the way they do. It's not just that they just you know need to be upgraded. Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a quote here from you from another talk that you gave. You said, when you look at the history of technology, the ones that went out are always the ones that work well with what's already there because there's already a lot of investment into existing infrastructure and you have to meet people where they are. And I feel the exact same way. We talk about building bridges from web two to web three, that we're not just going to 
build web three and, and everyone's going to come there, you know, they're already in web two and, and asking them to go into this almost new siloed system or something is completely unrealistic. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's sort of where the the challenge comes in. And, and what's exciting to me as, as like a developer is like figuring out how to bring people over and like, you know, what are people doing now and, and what are what are they actually frustrated with? Like a lot of times, you know, it's so easy to be like, oh, you know, we don't like big companies and this and that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there are reasons for that, there are good reasons to dislike platforms that have too much control, right? Um, but it's also kind of like there's a reason why people use those platforms because they provide certain conveniences and certain protections. And so I always thought it was really important to think about, you know, how can we replicate some of those things? Like when I first got into Bitcoin, um, I was a pretty hardcore libertarian or narco capitalist, I would say. And you know, I'm, I'm outing myself here, but you know that was sort of my 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 approach. And I would say, like at the root, I'm still that. I still I still believe that um, you know in self determination and decentralization and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I've also learned that like sometimes the real world is more complex. Like for example, right. there was a uh, one time we were consulting for a nonprofit called Thorn, and Thorn they basically combat online child abuse, um, and they had like a presentation where they showed some of the things that they their research team kind of found on the dark web, um, and they had basically a screenshot of a website where um, it was about a little girl who was um, uh, abducted, um, and she was going to be there was going to be this like live show, and there were different tiers where you could pay with Bitcoin. Um, and I remember looking at that slide and the Bitcoin addresses started with three, which was pay to script hash, which is a technology I help work on. And so there's like a technology I help work on used for that kind of purpose. And I sort of had sort of a moment where I just like almost, you know, passed out or threw out where I just really was like distraught and like even telling the story, I'm like getting, um, <laughs> getting a yeah, little. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. I mean, working on an indexing specification, almost every time I present, it's one of the first questions that I get is what are you going to do about mm. those kind of issues? So I completely understand the weight of that. It's heavy and horrifying. And so I, and I, and I think like there is a good answer, which is you just have to find controls that work, but can't be abused easily. Right. And like, you have to put controls mm -hmm. on the controls and like, you can't just be naive about in, in either direction. You can't be naive saying, oh, we're going to put these like benevolent dictators in, in charge and they're going to never abuse their power. Like that's not going to work. But at the same time, having no controls of any kind also isn't really a good idea, right? Um, and so right. it's like, you've got to find those, those compromises or those um, solutions, right? Well, and I think also the incentive structure too, right? Because the, the first two questions I always get are about um, pornography and than piracy. Mm -hmm. And if you can set up the incentive structure of the system to drive it down to the very minimum, rather than um, say it doesn't allow any piracy because that's just unrealistic because a digital file can almost always be copied. Mm -hmm. Instead, you change the dynamics of the model so that there is no incentive there and that the only sales that you're losing are ones that you never had to begin with mm -hmm. is kind of like the idea for how to shift that model. And so I think it's just like looking at each specific use case and how you should apply whatever theories and principles and technology to that specific use case. Um, so I'm going to just kind of take a little jump here because I've heard you talk about um, this in terms of like the optimization of a of a project right so like a lot of projects are now trying to do multiple things they're trying to be for payments and for smart contracts and for data storage or whatever it is right and that that you can't optimize and set up an incentive system that makes sense for all of those things at the same time and i just mm -hmm. wanted to kind of hear you talk about that in a little bit more detail and your thoughts about about that yeah right I, like I think like yeah I, I think for me it sort of started with um kind of looking at the internet and you know when you look at the internet there's all these different technologies that we might you know in everyday life sort of lump in with the internet but they're actually very complex separate technologies things like wi-fi and 5g and lte and like 
um, satellite uh, technologies and cable modems and like all these different things, like they all work very differently and they um, kind of bridge the gap between the raw physical medium and the internet protocol. And you kind of can ask yourself, like, why do we have so many different technologies? Why isn't just everything Ethernet? You know, well, because we don't want to sit in a coffee shop and, and try to run a cable across the room, right? Um, right? Or, you know, for me personally at home, I always make sure I have a hard line to the wall because I don't trust Wi-Fi for things like interviews, you know? Um, uh -huh. and, so, and so there are different use cases, right? And so what's really important is to have interoperability while at the same time yes. having as much flexibility where the people that are closest to the use case can do whatever they think is best for their for their specific use case. And so in the world of payments, it's sort of interesting to think about like, what does that mean? And I think part of it is something you already touched on, which is like legacy infrastructure. So for example, if you want to reach people in Africa, you probably want to think about how do I integrate with mobile money, right? Um, if you want to reach uh, people who are into blockchain, um, you probably want to think about how to integrate with that. You know, people in in where I come from in Germany, like a lot of them still use cash, and like there's certain German specific payment providers. You probably want to integrate some of that infrastructure. And so, I don't think there's like a single you know payment protocol that's going to work perfectly for the world that everyone's going to switch to. I think that's just not going to happen. But what the internet sort of showed is that what you can do is you can have a very minimal abstraction layer, and it's really important that that abstraction layer is kind of as simple as possible. Um, and the internet does a lot of really clever things to make itself as simple as possible. Like it's an addressing format and it's got a little packet header and then everything else is just sort of like, yeah, you do have however you want. Um, and it also uses this thing called the end-to-end -end principle. Um, and just to explain that really quickly, um, rather than trying to you know, solve the problem of what if a packet gets lost or what if a packet gets corrupted, at every hop along the chain over and over and at every layer in the in the protocol stack you just solve it once end to end you know and then if if all the other things are unreliable that's fine because at the end of the day you still have to solve the the, the problem of reliability anyway um, and so this does make sense to solve it like five times over at different layers of the stack and what that does is it kind of makes the whole stack simpler and most importantly makes the internet protocol itself really simple because it doesn't give you any of those guarantees it's just uh, the most minimal thing to get packets from A to B. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to be learned about how to make interoperability protocols from uh, the internet stack and, and kind of the whole internet ecosystem. Yeah, that makes sense. I have um, really enjoyed listening to your talks about, about how you guys got to penny switching. And when I was doing research, so I'll do a, a separate set of videos about web monetization that are just like me talking to the camera, explaining how it works, et cetera, that this video will complement. And when I was doing research for that, um, I learned that the Interledger protocol started in 2004, if I got that number right off the top of my head by a guy named Ryan Fugger. And then you guys have built, up, did you guys build upon that work or did you guys kind of like start from a blank page? That's the part I couldn't find in my research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm thrilled to tell that story. So um, so yeah, Ryan Fugger, I think is, is how he, he pronounces it. Oh, thank you. Um, I could be wrong by the way. That's just, um, you know, he hasn't corrected yeah. me when I've, I've called him that. So I hope that's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he created a protocol back in, yeah, I think 2004, definitely in the, in the 2000s somewhere. Um, he basically had the idea that like, well, if there's like six degrees of separation between anyone in the world, then um, shouldn't there be a way that I could say, hey, I owe you some money. And then that person knows someone who's closer to the destination. They say, I owe you some money and so on until you get to the recipient that you're trying to get money to. And you don't actually have to move any money right away. You can just work off of these IOUs and then maybe some money moves the other way. So it cancels out. So, you know, you just only have to occasionally actually physically move money around, right? Um, and I think that was, that was a really cool idea. And they built an implementation called Ripple, like they called it Ripple. Um, mm. And nothing to do, well, some things to do with the company that exists now, but uh, you know that was all predating that and predating. Is it just a coincidence that they have the same name, or did they? No, I th I think that um, both Chris Larson and Ryan Fugger were both Grateful Dead fans, I think, um, and so they named it after the song. Um, and so that's awesome. I, I think that was the the connecting. I hope I hope I'm getting this all right, but um, I'll try to stick to the things that I was personally there for. So um, sure, those I should get right at least. 
Um, and so basically what happened was uh, Jim McCaleb was obviously the founder of Mt. Gox. So he was like a, you know, hardcore Bitcoiner. Um, and so he was trying to figure out like, what does Bitcoin 2.0 look like? Like what would all the, you know, improvements that you'd want to make if you wanted to make Bitcoin better? Um, and there was like a long list of those. And, and you know, I was also very involved in that process um, together with Mike Hearn. Yeah, we were both in Switzerland. And so we'd spend a lot of time thinking about like better smart contracts, uh, faster confirmations, like what would you improve? And um, there was this thing called the hard fork wish list. I'm sure a lot of people have heard that uh, phrase before. It was basically like the list of the wish list of changes to Bitcoin that a lot of people wanted to make. Um, and so that's a lot of those changes ended up being incorporated in um, what Jim and Caleb called new coin. Um, and then later on, they started talking to Ryan Fugger. And the big problem that Ryan had was that all of his stuff was running on a central server. Um, and so there was always the threat that like some regulator might come in and, you know, mm -hmm. it might not, it might not last. And so um, they wanted to decentralize it and uh, Jet had this like new kind technology. And so that was like the perfect platform to implement the, the Ripple peer-to-peer -peer, um, credit system, but in a decentralized way. That was sort of the, the initial idea. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of like sidebars I could get sidetracked here. I'm sure, here, I'm sure. <laughs> I'll try to kind of get to Intelligia. So, you know, when, you know, Ripple, the decentralized blockchain network first launched, um, it was sort of like, um, you know, we were fully on that same use case that Ryan was interested in, the sort of peer-to-peer -peer credit. But I think we quickly had to uh, realize that like uh, most people, there's a reason most people aren't their own banks. Like it's it, being a bank sucks. Yeah. You do accounting all day and it's really boring and it's really annoying. And so <laughs> basically what happened is like there were these people who were like popular nodes in the network and so everyone would connect to them. And then their uh, credit lines with each other would constantly get maxed out because all the traffic was trying to go through those, right? And so imagine mm -hmm. you're trying to use the system and every five minutes, it's like, okay, your credit line's maxed out again. You got to go settle with your friend and Venmo them some money or something. And then five minutes later, it's like maxed out again. And so people just didn't maintain it. And very quickly, what happened was that people would start with what they called gateways, uh, which are basically little hubs. And they are more like banks. They're sort of professionally run nodes on the network. Um, and so a lot of traffic started to go through those. Um, and the other thing that happened was that the asset that was originally intended for uh, transaction fees only um, started to be used for like liquidity as well. And that became XRP. It was actually originally meant to be called XRS, XRP stamps or, you know, Ripple stamps. Um, and it was only later that those changed to, or the name we actually ended up going with was XRP because it started to have more broader uses other than just being a stamp. Um, and so anyway, so, so that worked for a while, but the problem was that those companies oftentimes weren't properly licensed. Um, and so they had various struggles. If they were trying to get licensed, that was very expensive and they didn't have the volumes to support that. And of course, you know, even if they had enough volume, like they didn't want to charge like huge fees and users didn't want to pay those huge fees. And so as a company, Ripple decided like, let's work with the incumbents that already have a lot of volume and convince them to upgrade to this new technology instead. Um, and so rather than talking about the rest of the, the history of the company Ripple, uh, let me stick to kind of what happened with Intelligence. So, you know, I was working on um, how to scale blockchains. Like, you know, how like we have all this growth and this like things are going well, but it's sort of foreseeable that at some point we'll run into the transaction per second limits right. on the blockchain. Um, another thing that was on my mind at that time was how do you integrate with existing systems, right? We're working with these legacy banks and they had these really slow ledgers and you couldn't like, you know, like even when, when you do like a debit card transaction, often that doesn't hit the bank's core ledger. It actually gets um, gets in, goes into like a buffer first because the core ledger is too slow. Um, I, and, and I think it's getting better, but like that was definitely a big issue. And so the I have started to realize that those two problems are actually related because when you're trying to scale a system, the easiest thing is to make multiple instances of the system. Um, but then if you have multiple instances, well, how do you connect them together? And I started to think about like, okay, well, what if you just view the world as all these different ledgers and you're just trying to go from one ledger to the other and it could be two shards of the XRP ledger or it could be two completely different systems, but how would that work? 
And if you sort of think about it from first principles, well, first of all, you know that they are not going to all be connected directly because the okay. number of potential connections goes up quadratically. And so you need some kind of multi-hop and you need some kind of routing. Um, and so then you can start to think about like, okay, well, if you have multi-hop, how do you prevent someone who's like three hops down the line from you from stealing the money? Um, because on the internet protocol, if you drop a packet, it's not a big deal. You just resend it, right? But if right. you send money, it's sort of like this big incentive to drop as many packets as you can. Um, <laughs> And we, you know, to the best of my memory, like we invented a, um, a mechanism to address that, but the Lightning Labs um, a team or the Lightning Protocol team uh, published it first. So I have to give them the credit. Uh, basically, it was an idea that you split the payment into two phases and the first phase proceeds forward and the second phase proceeds backward. Um, okay. And so that aligns the incentives, right? Um, and again, you know, a lot of this isn't really I wouldn't call it super opinionated. Like there's a reason why Lightning evolved in very much the same lines as, as Interledger did, um, because that's just how you solve these problems. That's like the best way to solve these problems. Um, and so you could view Interledger as a continuation of Ryan's original Ripple idea, because it is still kind of a IOU or like credit network with occasional settlement. Um, I do st think though that I view it now as being something where the nodes are generally professional nodes, or at least the, the nodes in the core of the network are, you know, payment companies that do this for a living. Um, because I think regular people just don't want to deal with the stuff that goes into being a money transmitter, um, you know, service, you know. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. So do the node operators uh, charge a fee? Do they make money by charging a fee somehow? Um, so that's actually really interesting. So, um, well, in the current iteration of Interledger, in the current live network, um, they don't. Um, the way that they fund themselves in the current network is from two sources. One is from foreign exchange. So if you go from one currency to another, they will charge an exchange rate. Um, and that exchange rate isn't the spot price, but like, you know, whatever they pay plus a little bit. Um, okay. And then the other way that they make money is actually fixed costs, like for example, coil. For us to have an Interledger uplink, we pay a monthly fee to um, uphold. Um, and so that's sort of another way. It's sort of like, it's actually how the internet uh, is financed. Like you're not so much mm -hmm. paying per traffic if you're a bigger node, you're usually just paying for the bandwidth. And in some cases, if you're peering with another equal provider, you, you might not pay each other anything because you're just both gaining from the additional productivity or sorry, connectivity. Um, and so, um, yeah, you, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but that's sort of how it works today. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I've been curious about how how to get hooked into Interledger. Is the process permissionless? Yeah, so the way it works is almost exactly the same as the internet in terms of like, to be on the internet, you have to peer with someone who's on the internet. Um, oh, sorry. No, what I mean is if I want, like right now, Interledger works with XRP and probably a few other, th other dollars and, and Bitcoin probably. Mm -hmm. But if we wanted to hook a chain into Interledger that's not there, is that mm -hmm. process permissionless? That's what I mean. Yeah, the, 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 um, there's no, it's sort of like it doesn't even make sense to say it's permissionless. So it is, it is like there's nobody who needs to give you permission, but the reason is important. So um, the way it works is that you peer with someone on the network. And then how you settle, or even if you settle, is completely up to you, right? So like, for example, if I was on the network and you wanted to peer with me and we agreed that, you know, we'd meet like once a month um, in the park and you'd hand me collectible <laughs> marbles and I would count the marbles and see if that was enough to settle our debt, that would be fine. Interledger wouldn't care. Like that would be fine for us to do it that way. Um, and so it doesn't even make sense to say like Interledger supports this chain or that chain. It literally just takes two parties that happen to want to settle using a certain mechanism. Now, if you want to automate the settlement, you may want to write like some kind of script that automatically sends money through some underlying system, but that can literally be like, you know, a few lines of code, like, hey, do this Bitcoin transaction or do this, you know, Dogecoin transaction or literally any payment mechanism that you can call via an API, you know, so. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so are there, is there a good place to look for resources if somebody wanted to set up their own chain with Interledger or mm -hmm. something like that? So I think the challenge right now is like the way that the regulations are written, um, 
you kind of have to be a regulated financial institution if you want to pass around money for people. Um, gotcha. And so the approach that we've taken is like, okay, well, you know, we first actually built a network that was sort of for end users to run their own nodes and so on. Um, but then, of course, when you go to regulated institutions, like, for example, crypto exchanges, and you say, like, hey, connect to this network, they're like, well, we can't because it's like all these randos, we don't know who they are, you know, and so on. And so we're like, okay, actually, like, let's try just to work with regulated institutions. And so the way that you'd want you get onto the network is you would have to be a regulated financial institution. Um, now, obviously, if you're a developer, let's say, uh, you also want to be able to access the network. So how does that work? Well, the way we think it's going to work is that there will be some institutions, just like there are internet service providers that give you access to the internet, there'll be institutions that give you access to Interledger, and they basically take the risk. Um, and unfortunately for that, there's a lot of um, infrastructure that needs to be built out um, for them to be comfortable taking that risk, because you can literally, you know, if you have raw Interledger access, you can literally start sending packets to any address. Um, and so we're kind of in the process right now to, you know, trying to get them comfortable with that idea and so on. Um, and so as of the re this recording right now, um, it's not possible yet really to connect to Interledger. If you're a company, um, you could reach out to some of the Interledger nodes like GitHub and Uphold um, and, and kind of ask and see if, if they're willing to work with you. Um, but it mostly depends on, are you going to bring a bunch of volume? Um, in the future, okay. we hope that it'll be as simple as like the same way you connect to Interledger. You just sign up, you get an access code, and then you can like uh, connect through that provider. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Sure. Yeah. Well, we've got a ways to go on Web3 still. So um, I, uh, while we're yeah. on the topic of, of interoperability, I wanted to ask about uh, the web monetization standard and its interoperability as well. So it's built to work with Interledger, but could it work with other blockchain interconnect approaches like Polkadot or Cosmos? Yeah, I mean, all web monetization really is, is like a browser standard. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about like, should we try to support other um, like payment methods or something like that? But it's sort of it, like in some ways it goes against the, the point of IntelliJ because it's sort of like IntelliJ is supposed to be the minimal abstraction layer. And so to add another abstraction on top of the abstraction starts to get mm -hmm. technically a little bit clunky. Um, so Right now, there isn't anything like that. I would say if someone wanted to make their own web monetization like thing, so I think someone actually did make a lightning version, for example, um, it's not that hard to do. Um, I think that, you know, obviously I'm biased, but like my, my thought would be like Interledger is specifically designed to be, um, to be the universal thing. And, and, you know, if you want to have your own chain or something like that, like, you know, just make an Interledger adapter. And, and, you know, like I said, it really doesn't matter what chain you use underneath, it, it should just work. And so um, I think that there isn't anything quite like that out there. Like even Lightning requires a lot of stuff from the underlying chain in order to work. Okay. Um, I've also been wondering now about COIL itself and you guys have talked about, so I, it's kind of like a two part question because I know that currently COIL pays like 36 cents per hour, uh, but that you're talking about this new tool called Rafiki, is that right? That will expand upon that. Um, but also that part of COIL's mission is to make it not something that the end user has to think about, that they just pay their $5 and then the subscription is, is happening for them. And so I've been wondering, I, I understand what kind of things that you would be looking at, but I'm trying to understand how you're going to be getting the data points from either the users or the sites that they're visiting to know if you need to turn up the amount of money or turn down the amount of money. Like how, how are you going to tune that? Where are you gonna get that feedback from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing I would say is that Coil is obviously just one provider. And I think for this to work well, there has to be other providers. Um, I think volume wise, we're not quite there yet. We've definitely tried to encourage other entrepreneurs to get into that business. Um, they're not quite seeing the, the opportunity yet, but hopefully soon. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know if we'll have the perfect answer. So I, I'm hoping other people will try, you know, their luck at it. Um, in terms of how we look at it, I would say that 
um, we've sort of taken an approach of like extreme privacy. Like for example, we use a blind signature scheme um, to disassociate each um, packet from the user that's sending it. Um, and the reason we do that is because we think like, you know, if there's a lot of web monetized websites, we don't want to know which websites you're going to. And so we need some scheme to disassociate that. Um, I think as far as like the payout, um, you know, the user, I think eventually will be spending their own money. So right now we have sort of this flat rate model, but I think once we have the right licensing and the right ability to do that, we'll probably have more like a pay as you go type model, the same way you pay for you know, some data plans or your electricity bill or something like that. So if you use it more, it might cost a little bit more. Um, and so at that point, we can give you a lot more control. So we can say like, hey, you know, maybe we have different categorizations of websites and you want to say like news websites I want to pay for, but I don't want to pay for big tech or, you know, I want to boost independent creators, but I don't want to boost, um, you know, certain political uh, sites or something like that. And so I think in the future, we'd love to give you that sort of granularity. Um, and obviously, like, you know, we will design products with feedback from our users. So if we roll out a feature and people are like, yeah, you know, that's not really what I was looking for, what we were looking for, um, we'll adjust and we'll go a slightly different direction. So it's a little bit hard to predict like what path users will lead us down. Um, but, it, you know, for the most part, it'll be a combination of us looking at the sites manually. Um, I think one thing people don't really realize is that the Google index isn't just some algorithm. It's actually like a huge team of people reviewing websites all day. Um, another uh, can be like, you know, some automation where like we look at websites and we try to identify or like detect if something's very clickbaity or not very high quality or something like that. Um, and then the third signal would be like uh, information the user is specifically putting into their settings. And again, we'll try to disassociate it from their identity. So those would be sort of the three main signals that we plan to use. Okay, that's interesting. I think that Open Index Protocol could potentially offer part of that solution as well in terms of mm -hmm. setting up a public market where the creators can publish their terms, platforms can publish their terms, even all of that kind of stuff can be in, in a public place where then mm -hmm. the apps that are building on it can just use that information or the um, payment you know, extensions can use that information to help figure out, well, this piece of content costs $5, this piece of content costs two cents and pay that, you know, accordingly kind of thing. So, that seems really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's just really interesting. Uh, one thing I want to say real quick is like, obviously, once you start talking about more expensive content, like if something costs like $2 or something, you'd probably want to ask the user. Um, and that obviously, that's the easy, that's the easy answer. But um, I think that the types of content where you know, we really felt it had to be passive is, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't want to prove every one cent that I'm saying right. to reward someone for the free photo right. that's used in this article. It's right? that Nick Zabo that, like decision fatigue kind of problem that you're trying to exactly. find the line of like, how much is the right amount to auto pay versus not auto pay? When do you ask the user? Yeah, and again, look at, I think it was um, in your first episode um, where you talked about like the, the siloed uh, platforms always show what the demand is, right? And I think like users demand something where they can just pay a fixed amount and then forget about it. And like they have access to everything. And so there's no reason why we couldn't get very close to that user experience on the web. Um, it just has to be like, you know, I think that the web monetization provider has to do a lot of work to make it feel that magical. Yeah. Um, while still like, obviously from the user's perspective, it still has to feel like their interests are being represented. Like you don't want to have you know, you don't want to go back to like an algorithm that doesn't do what you want, right? But at least, they, right. you know, you, talk, you were talking about incentives, like at least we have the right incentives, like we don't have any advertisers or anything like that. We just care about our users and how happy they are with the service. Right, right. You guys have talked about how it's in a way the web monetization standard is kind of like the user opening the negotiation on price because they're paying mm -hmm. that amount. And I think that open index protocol kind of can bring in like the the creator also kind of countering that and saying, well, this is the price so mm -hmm. that there, that negotiation can happen. Uh, I, I think that's going to be really interesting to watch that play out as we kind of, you know, roll into web three, how that works. We've had some really interesting use cases that have come up. Already. For example, there was a, a web monetized search engine and they made the point that like, look, 
if our users are spending more time looking at search results, that means we're doing a bad job because we didn't find the thing that they were looking for. And so in some cases, you have to almost like flip it and pay more the less time the user spends. And so I think there won't be like one model that works for every type of site and every type of application. I think you have to have a bunch of different stuff. And, and obviously, again, like premium content is going to work very differently than, you know, very, you know, free content, you know, what's what's free today. Um, where I might still want to support the creator, but it's more discretionary. So um, I think we just have to find solutions for these different use cases. I, I agree. Absolutely. Okay. I have one more quote from you. You said, we have no ambition of being as big as Netflix. I would consider us having failed if we become the next Netflix. Instead, I want to see us grow into a community that's much larger than uh, that and has lots of different companies that are either providers or creating content that are independent, that are successful, and that are able to efficiently monetize using some sort of open technology, the same sort of open technology we use at Coil. And we have that exact same perspective when it comes to people using open index protocol. We have a, a browser called Alexandria. Well, it's not a browser. It's anyway, I won't get into that, but uh, we're building tools, you know, at, under our company, Alexandria Labs, but we want, and people are using it for lots of other kinds of things. And we actively support them. And we'll have these sort of awkward moments and meetings where they're like, well, what's your incentive for supporting us? You know, and at some point they're like, oh, so we could be competitors someday. You know, if, if we're serving some kind of video content and they're, they're serving some kind of video content, we're like, well, yeah, but we're still genuinely helping you. We're not like secretly sabotaging you or something. Have you gotten weird responses from saying that kind of thing to people that you guys are interested in building this bigger, smaller web in a way? Kind of like. Yeah, there's a, um, I think it's a series of napkins or maybe just a series of pieces of paper, um, which uh, defines the, the, what's called BGP, the routing protocol of the internet. And it has two uh, sets of authors, like from Cisco and from IBM. And you can sort of think of like, like, why would these arch rivals work together on this protocol? And I think like the reason for that, and sometimes it's called like co-opetition or something like that. It's like, we can't go up against Netflix, even if we wanted to, like if we wanted to, like if, if right. I tried to raise money to, by saying like, hey, we're gonna unseat Apple as like the mobile platform of choice or whatever, I think people would laugh at me, right? But to say like, hey, we're teamed up with all these other people that have an interest in some open ecosystem where things work differently. Well, that is more realistic. That's something that could potentially happen because I think that these proprietary systems, there's always people that want to get away from that, you know? Um, and so that's the reason why we do it. Um, you know, also there's personal reasons. Like I said, I grew up with the web and I kind of I, I felt, feel really privileged to have all this opportunity when I was growing up. And I see on some level, I see that going away. Um, and I wanna, I'm thinking like, what do I wanna look back on, you know, on my deathbed one day? What, when I, what do I wanna be able to say? And I wanna be able to say that I tried to prevent that from, from going too far down that path, you know? Um, and Absolutely. so, you know, I, I, I take a lot of comfort that there have always been companies that have bet on open technologies and still found a way to make money. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're just so early in that process that right now we're just trying to get it off the ground and that's hard enough. And so- So early, so yeah. early, I know, uh, yeah. I'm, so, very, I'm very comfortable that like we have some really smart people at Coil and we'll come up with a way to, to make money down the road, I'm, I'm sure. Well, so tell me about what you think about what Web3 is going to look like, right? Because I see you guys taking both kind of like the bottom up and top down approach simultaneously at Coil by investing in Imager and Hacker Noon and the W3C, but then also doing this grant program with Grant for the Web and doing like a lot of small grants and trying to bring creators in. And I watched, I just want to say for the creators that are watching this, they did an interview with Collab and Sundance and you did. And um, who is the other guy's name? Uh, Tom. Tom, maybe. Yeah. And yeah. it's fantastic. Everybody watching this should watch that um, to learn more about it. But you guys are really going after, it, it, it's like you're, are you just like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks? Or do you guys like have some sort of master plan for like top down, bottom up at the same time and we'll somehow meet in the middle or what's your thinking there? How's that going to roll out to you? Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously on some level, it's like opportunistic. Like if, if there's an organization that's interested in working with us, we're not going to say no to that. That would be pretty antithetical to the idea of an open standard as well. 
Um, I, I do think though that we have certain focus areas, like we spend a lot of time thinking about web developers and like, you know, can we get some of the resources that they use uh, monetized? Um, we supported, for example, uh, Open Web Docs, uh, which is um, uh, you know, essentially the, I have to use the right term here, but it's sort of an organization um, of the people who used to work on MDN, uh, Mozilla Developer Network. Um, when Mozilla wasn't willing to to continue that in its in its existing form, um, and so we helped fund the, that continuation, make sure those writers still get paid and so on. Um, and the hope is like someday, like there could be maybe there's some perks for people who are supporting open web docs through web monetization or something like that, you know. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that we've we've definitely found some communities where um, there is more uptake and more interest, and like obviously right now. You're not gonna get rich on web monetization, um, so it's yeah. Right. You, you have to find people that are. Willing but the potential to is the, so clear. Yeah. It's so clear, and it's so different when it's when you have so much more control over it. I've been seeing this massive movement among creators lately that are going back to their email list as the primary thing that they push people toward, and it's because email is a protocol, so they control it. That sovereignty exists, right? And that's what we're talking about shifting. That's so powerful. What do you see that shift looking like? Do you think that there'll be these inflection points and do you have any idea of what they'll be or do you think it'll just be like a slow attrition? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that creators are still heavily, heavily motivated by where their audience is and by necessity because every creator needs to grow their audience. Um, and so I think what we have to see is, is some creators have to be leaders where they help educate the common person uh, about these new technologies and that they exist and, and why they should support them. Um, and I think that will start to create more and more of a platform for the, the broader uh, set of creators that maybe don't have as much flexibility um, to, to also make the jump. And I think once you get it going, it, it just, yeah, it can grow very quickly because you know, people mm -hmm. have a better time there. They have um, more flexibility, more options. Um, for example, as a user, maybe I want to have a client that works on Linux and like I can get that there where I can't get it from Netflix, for example, you know? Um, and so I think that it's a little bit, um, you just have to get it kind of initially off the ground. And the way you do that, again, we always look at the internet for inspiration for almost any problem we run into. And when you look at the early internet, yeah, uh, there's this like awesome news segment on on YouTube where you can watch it. And it's like you know somebody like the the anchors are trying to understand what is this internet thing, and you have to like <laughs> dial in over the phone, and it takes five dollars to download the the today's paper. And why would you pay five dollars to download the paper when you can just get it for fifty cents at the street corner? You know, um, and a lot has changed since then. And I think that like we're still in this early sort of experimentative phase, especially when it comes to things like web monetization and Interledger. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's been plenty of interest and especially like, you know, we get all this interest in blockchain. I think the longer someone uh, is in blockchain, they start to see some of the, the limitations of that technology. And they start to think about mm -hmm. like, how do you solve that? And what's next and what, what's just behind the horizon. And a lot of those people tend to look at protocols like Lightning, like Interledger, um, sometimes call it like layer two type protocols. And I think that's mm -hmm. really where the future is. It's like you can do so much with these types of approaches. Awesome. All right. Well, final question. What kind of internet do you want? Um, I want an internet. <laughs> so I want an internet where it's not just reading, it's also writing. Um, and it's also getting compensated for that writing. Um, and I think like what we sort of see in is the internet protocol has sort of opened up a lot of information for people all over the world. Um, but the feedback that 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 I, or the, the, the reaction I sort of see is like a lot of people when they are in places where there's less access to the banking system, like in Tanzania, only 2% of adults have a bank account. And it's like, well, if you don't have a bank account, you can't get a credit card. If you can't get a credit card, you can't get paid out from certain services. And so you can have this like very popular blog, but then how do you actually make money on it? Because you can't use AdSense, you can't use this and that. And so, you know, those are sort of the problems that I think that a interoperability protocol in payments uh, could solve. Um, and so I want an internet where people can both read information freely, but then also if they contribute something, they can get paid for it. I want that too. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you so much for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Same. Where can people find you? Yeah. Um, so for me personally, I can be, uh, I'm on uh, Twitter as just moon. 
Um, has nothing to do with crypto going to the moon. I picked the name long before crypto was a thing. Um, and then for the company, you can find it at coil.com or also coil on Twitter, C-O-I-L. And then Interledger, you can find it at interledger.org. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.